awesome God. We serve a God that answers prayer. Amen. There's not a need that we have. Amen. But he knows it. Amen. And he said if we would come to him and ask that we would receive. He said if two or three agree touching any one thing. Amen. That they should have it. And I'm, I, I kind of believe the word of God. I think the word of God is true. I think the promises of God are true. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer for these needs. And if there's anybody sick in the house or a need in, in your life, we invite you to come up to the front. Let us anoint you with oil. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, the scripture says. Amen. Lord Jesus, we love you today. God, we thank you for every promise in the book, God. Lord, we stand on every word, God. Lord, on every syllable, God. Hallelujah. And we thank you for it, God. We, Lord, we ask you to touch Donald this morning. Brother and Sister Russell today, God. Lord Janie, Lord, and Jubilee, God. Lord Jesus, every one of these needs, God, you know how to touch, God. Lord, you can take cancer away, Lord. God, you can bring strength back into feeble bodies, Lord. In Jesus' name, Lord, let the answer go, God. Lord, dispatch the answer from here, God, to there, Lord. In the name of Jesus, and we give you the honor and the glory and the praise.
your holy and mighty name. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. While we have this atmosphere of power and the mighty anointing of the Holy Ghost, somebody say, greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. Hallelujah. We're going to pray for the nation of Iceland. Every Sunday we pray for a different nation. And I believe there is power in people that pray, that unite together in one mind and one accord. I believe that when we speak, that our words travel very quickly. Hallelujah. I believe that there is a voice that moves so powerfully and quickly and that is the voice of the people of God that are praying hallelujah so let's pray for this nation right now Lord God we pray for Iceland I pray God that a revival will be upon that land all those dark clouds that would hover over that land and keep depression and darkness and sickness and disease upon those people we we speak in the name of Jesus that there would be a mighty army of the living God that will go and move those clouds out of the way Lord God we pray healing upon those people we pray the peace of God be upon their mind and their spirit we pray for the missionaries the pastors the preachers, the evangelists. We pray, dear Lord God, for revival to sweep across that nation and the blessing of the Lord be upon that place. We pray for the leaders, Lord God, of that nation. God, that you would open up their hearts. They would be awakened unto truth. We pray in the name of Jesus, the blessing of the Lord, the revival of the Almighty God. Sweep through that land in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Exalted in praise be the name of the Lord God Almighty, for his name is worthy to be praised, for his name is holy, for his name is all power, his name is all wonderful, his name is anointed, his name is what we need, his name is what everybody needs. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As the ushers are coming this morning, I'd like to show I'd like to give a short testimony. We still have a God who's alive and well. We still have a God who's giving visions and giving dreams. We still have a God who's giving peace in the time of turmoil. We still have a God who's alive, who's all powerful, who's almighty, who's all everlasting, who he is not, he needs no counsel to make decisions or choices. To him, I want to put our hands together. To him, I want to give glory. To him, I want to jump for. To him, I want to worship. To him, I want to dedicate myself and all that I have unto. We'd like to make welcome every single one of our guests this morning. Thank you for coming out and exalting the name of the Almighty God with us this morning. Thank you so much. As you bring your tithes and offering, please don't forget to go around showing and expressing a life to one, the, the love of Christ to one another. Amen. Lord, we come before you. Oh, wait. Wait, I almost went on my own. Let's unite in prayer. Let's unite in prayer instead, yeah? I almost went on my own right there. Thank God. Thank God for obedience. I had to stop myself in the tracks. Amen. Let's pray together. Upon the authority and by the orders of your word, I have given, and it will be given to me, pressed down and shaken together and running over. I am a tither and a giver, and I bring my tithe and offering today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commission, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritance, bills paid off, debts dismissed, royalties received. My greatest desire is that my whole family will be saved and walking with God in perfect health, abundance, and to walk in the divine favor and blessing. I shall be blessed going in. I shall be blessed going out and all that I do will prosper in Jesus name. Amen. It is so. You can bring your offering.
praise God. Somebody shout praise the Lord. Come on, somebody, you need to shout it. Come on, let it come out from the deep down inside. Praise the Lord.
feel the Holy Ghost in this house. Come on, I feel the power of the Almighty God in this house. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, my God. Come on, I believe anything can happen today. One of the things that got my attention, I began praying about this river of living water and how when the enemy raises up a flood the Lord said I'm going to raise up a standard and that is my flood's bigger than yours <laughs> and when the Lord sends his flood fountains of the great deep are going to bust the windows of heaven are going to open things are going to happen in the spiritual world <laughs> Hallelujah. The Lord led my attention back into Genesis. Even the highest mountain, the flood that came from God was 20 foot higher than the highest peak and the highest mountain that was upon this earth. I believe when we speak to the mountain, come on, he said, out of your belly shall flow room. Out of your mouth, you speak to it. Let the flood that comes from the world of glory, the, the spirit of life, it'll take care of the mountain. Come on, we got to realize the power that is within us. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Come on, can you see your biggest mountain being taken care of right now by the river of living water? Come on, I got the river. I've got the river. Hallelujah. I'm getting out of the way. We got the evangelist here. Brother Gordon Pole. We had a great time and times are refreshing. Hallelujah. And it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning of what God is going to do. Hallelujah. We love and appreciate Brother Pole. I appreciate the truth that he stands for and has always stood for. Hallelujah, Brother Poe, come. You're no stranger. So come preach what God's given you. Everybody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank your choir, praise team, and all of those that are worshiping the Lord. Thank you, Brother. We had a great time at TOR. And um, you that missed it need to get the CDs out there today. And you're going to hear three different styles of preachers that gave three different messages all tied together. <clears throat> One thing about Time to Refreshing, I have never, ever in 23 years ever told a man what to preach. I've had some of them ask me, what is your theme? And I said, reaching the lost, restoring the glory and uh, having the miraculous. And uh, I, well, is there a certain th subject? And I went, Jesus. I heard one time a man said, he said from the pulpit, I have nothing to preach. And I was like, then quit. <laughs> if you can't preach on Jesus, amen. Everybody say amen. Now my mission is not to be your friend. I want to make it plain, so this is the first time I think that I've preached here besides yesterday. And uh, I want y'all to hear what I say, and I want you to repeat what I say. Gordon Poe did not write the Bible. So if I get mad about what he preaches, I'm not mad at him. I'm mad at God. Mm. <laughs> now see, that took your weapon away. Amen. You can't get mad at me for preaching something you're not reading. Whoo, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I read the other day, I don't read much on Facebook. My wife's kind of 
put me, taken me off of Facebook for a little bit because I'm extremely political. I'm not just a little political, I'm an American. And I, I do believe in America first. And we've been the world's piggy bank for years. And uh, I don't, I'm one of the preachers. I'm, in fact, I've had a lot of you saints say, well, I never heard no preacher stand up like that. I thought there was a thing called church, separation of church and state. Well, you haven't read the Constitution. There's not one. That's just a myth. That's not one. Bill Clinton did more advertising in churches than he did on the news. So there's not a thing that's called church and state. I mean, everybody says, well, there are 501c3. You can't endorse a candidate, but that don't mean you can't preach the truth. <laughs> so I know, I got a GED, so I know some stuff. <laughs> I'm state educated. And, um, and so I'm not here to make enemies. I've never ever walked out of a, Office of a pastor going, I'm fixing to make everybody mad. So if you find what I preach offensive, it's not my problem, it's your problem. Let me say that again. I had a man one time I prophesied over his daughter and he come up to me after church and he said, I want you to apologize to her. And I said, for, he said, that was my daughter. And you, you, you offended her. And I said, that ain't my problem. I told her what God said. She's got a problem. Now you got a problem. He said, what's my problem? I said, now you've come after the preacher. The preacher just told her what the Lord said. It will come to pass. Three years later, he come up to me and he apologized. And he said, it came to pass. I want you to forgive me. I said, I forgave you the day I walked out of the building. I never thought no more about it. I ain't taking back what the Lord says. I'm not stupid. I got a GED. So I don't offend people on purpose. So if the Lord, and then let me, let, listen, I'm, we're just trying to lay some groundwork here, see. Over at Joel's church this morning, there is nobody going to get offended. Hello? You say, well, you're, are you going to say names? We all, yeah, Joel Osteen. I'm saying names. Why? Because they're called false prophets. And the Bible says, point out the false prophets. But there's nobody going to get offended. Nobody. You can do anything you want to. Now, I'm going to share with you something before I preach. I got real mad at the Lord. Has anybody ever been mad at the Lord besides me? Come on, raise your hand. Don't go to hell over a question. <laughs> And I, I was just, you know, as a preacher, sometimes you just, and, and Brother Martin and all of us just, we just, it's like, my God, I preached it and it just doesn't click. What is the deal? And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, why in the world are there hypocrites? They're just hypocrites. They're just blatantly open hypocrites. I said, why don't you just wipe them out? Anybody ever prayed for your enemy to be first? <laughs> Bill Davis, one of the speakers, he said, the reason I write Westerns is because I place my enemy's picture in my mind and they're always the bad guy and I shoot them. <laughs> And I said, why, do, why don't we have hypocrites? Why? Why can't people just live for God? It's not that hard. And here's what the Lord told me, finally. He said, the hypocrite can only be a hypocrite in a place where there's truth. There are no hypocrites in a place that doesn't preach truth. In other words, down at all them other churches, there's no such a thing as a hypocrite. And I went, well, I'm understanding that. And then he said, and a hypocrite's for you. And I went, for me? He went, yeah, that shows you what not to be. So don't get, don't get next to somebody that ain't praising the Lord 
and mad about people that are praising the Lord. Just, just move over a little bit and find somebody that worships God with you. Don't let somebody intimidate you because you're worshiping and clapping. In fact, maybe you ought to clap your hands a little louder to make sure that that person knows I'm not going to be intimidated by what you say or what you do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So thank you so much, all of you that volunteered and did so much to make that meeting a great success. The choirs, my Lord, y'all sing. I, I love the way, and just what Sister Martin did a while ago, I'm like, now that's what I'm talking about. You know, going from that, I don't know if they call it a medley or what they call that, where you go medley. Yeah, I like all that because that's some of them songs I heard. You know what I mean? I've been down to the water. That's, and, and man, that, that'll get up in your feet. All that other stuff, by the time you read it, it's already changed. You don't even know what you said. But boy, I mean, you, you get to down up in your feet and up in your hands and up in your head. And I, when she said, call him up, call him up, tell him what you want. Why don't you call him up, call him up. Tell him what you want. I was, I was like, now, nah, well, girl, girl, go on with that right there now. Woo. Amen. Let's sing that three or four times. Amen. And so this morning, I'm going to preach from the book of Genesis. I'm going to try to help everybody here. The book of Genesis, the 18th chapter. And we're very familiar. Most people are with this because it's about Abraham and Lot. And um, there's been some problems. And we're going to read starting with verse number 20. And the Lord said, because of the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And because their sin is very grievous. I will go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which is coming to me. And if not, I will know. Now this is a very strange scripture because you've got an all-knowing God saying, I'm going to go down there and check it out myself. In other words, I know all, now watch this, I know all, but there's sometimes I make on a personal appearance. So when people say God is everywhere, that's not really that big of a statement because surely he is everywhere or we wouldn't even be breathing. But sometimes God makes a personal appearance because he wants to see what's going on. Now he knows what's going on, but he wants to be there and watch it happening. That's the reason I ain't gonna preach on this, but that's the reason you know, when people preach on the devil in Pentecost and people shout and you preach on angels and you get scared. What do you think the devil is? Fallen angel. But that's the reason I've seen personally with my own eyes angels appear in the services because they want to see what's going on. They see, they hear through the heavenlies but they want to see what's going on, so they stop to visit because they would trade places with a praiser any day. Think about that one for a minute. They would become tempted of sin just to be able to say his name. For angels don't cry, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They cry, holy, holy, holy. Hold on just a minute. I'm about to preach something I shouldn't be preaching on maybe because y'all get to say Jesus. They don't even get to say Jesus. They would trade places with you just to say Jesus. No, oh, you didn't catch it. In other words, they say them dirt bags get to say his name and we can't even say his name. I'd rather be a dirt bag and tempted than be able to praise him than be an angel saying holy, 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 holy. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's just a little Bible study there. 
And so the Bible said, and the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Abraham stood yet before the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you for standing and worshiping and praising. As most of you know, Abraham was chosen to be the father of faith. Abraham had left his country in which his father was a very, in fact, his father was the high priest. And so it was very disturbing when Abraham takes his tribe and leaves because it was sort of a slap in the face of this high priest, his father. Uh, they, and in then the city that Abraham was raised in, they sacrificed virgins and children and they would cut their throat and they would let the blood run down the, the steps and they would kill them and slaughter them until the blood ran from the top step to the bottom step, however many people that took. And that happened once a year. So Abraham uh, was raised in that environment and the Lord called him out of that environment. So it was a very uh, strong calling. And he left, the Bible says, not knowing where he went. And Abraham had no clue about what he was uh, destined to be. And so now we see that Lot's traveling with him. And uh, you know the story how that Lot, his herds grew following Abraham. I heard, I believe it was Brother Falls, Brother Davis, one of them say that God, Lot really had not, or did not have a walk with God, that Abraham had a walk with God. But I want to just point out that Lot's wealth was increased by walking with somebody that knew God. And then and there was a strife, the Bible said. Now, I'm just going to give you some old East Texas thinking here. If, if I am broke and I'm walking with somebody that's got a lot of money and then suddenly there's an issue because my money and his money is the same amount. And I know I got my money because he helped me get my money. Why would I leave him? Why don't I spend a bunch of money? In other words, let me play it like this. Lot, you got rich following Abraham, but you're going to separate why didn't you just kill a bunch of your herds and stay with that man that had to walk with God? See, when you separate yourself from somebody that has a higher walk with the Lord, you're destined to lose everything. Let me say it again. You're destined to lose everything. And so now Lot is, has lost everything and he's actually got a job and if you'll notice, he has no sheep, no cattle. He has no tents. He's living in a house. He's a judge in the gate. He's actually judging homosexuality and who's right and who's wrong. Well, it's just wrong. It ain't a who's right and who's wrong. He's just a, a, a guy. So he's learned to, to judge sin according to its depth, so to speak. And uh, in other words, he compromised what he learned from Abraham to survive in Sodom. And now we see the Bible says, not Gordon, but the Bible says that this Sodom and Gomorrah and all of that valley was so wicked that the Lord says, I am fixing to wipe them all out. Now, I want to, you to understand something quickly uh, this morning about mercy and grace. Most people misuse the term grace. Grace is favor. Uh, grace is favor. 
And so you can't have the favor of God until you've been baptized in Jesus' name or you were living in the Old Testament following the laws and the covenant. Now, none of y'all are, are in the Old Testament following the laws and the covenant. So if you have not been baptized in Jesus' name and received the Holy Ghost, you do not, cannot fall under the word grace. You fall under the word mercy. So when people out there are saying, well, the Lord, I'm under the grace message after the cross. No, you're not because you didn't follow Acts 2.38. So you're not under the cross. That's a GED talking. Well, I see some of you like, well, I like the word grace. Well, you don't know the definition. Now the word grace in the New Testament, thank you, sir. The word grace in the New Testament became very popular simply because they were killing everybody. The, the, the letters that we have, the epistles are called letters, or the letters are called epistles. And so they were saying, I salute you in the Holy Ghost. And so when they captured those letters, those people that they were writing to, they went and killed them all because they were saluting them in the Holy Ghost. And they knew the Holy Ghost had been poured out in Acts 2.38. And so these were those Christians that they had begun to call Christians at Antioch. And so they were using those letters to, to, like, to, to, to find these Christians. And so the apostles, if you'll notice, quit using the word Holy Ghost and started using the word grace because the Holy Ghost is the favor of the Lord. And so they started using, I salute you in the grace of the Most High. Well, when the soldiers would get the word grace, they didn't have a clue what grace meant, so they just went ahead and let the letters through. Don't think for a minute that the apostles didn't understand that grace was extended to those that had repented, been baptized in Jesus' name, and received the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you haven't received the gift of the Holy Ghost and been baptized in Jesus' name, you need to step from mercy and you need to get under the umbrella of grace and hurry up and do it before it's too late. Can I get a witness from the holy everybody in the church? Hallelujah. And so this gracious, merciful God that, that some of these churches are wanting to preach. See, we're not preaching judgment anymore because nobody likes it. Everybody wants wants to hear about, I'm fixing to get blessed. Well, you might be fixing to get blessed with a car wreck. I don't know how you decide that. But the, everybody wants to hear about how, how good I am. And, and I understand that. I like to hear the same thing. I like to hear you did well. But sometimes I hear from my elders that wasn't very wise. And I go, oops. I did it again. I mean, no. I go, oops. See, you know, this is a Pentecostal church. You can smile in the Pentecostal church. The Catholics, you can't, but you're, here you can. And it's like I saw one lady. I was real stoned years ago, and, uh, and she was walking down the mall of Longview, and I was ripped, man. I was like Jimi Hendrix. I was in the purple haze. And... Uh, she was a Pentecostal woman and had her hair all up and her face was all long like this. And she was just like. And I looked at my brother and I said, now that right there will make you do drugs. <laughs> Amen. He said, I agree with you. Let's go roll one. Amen. I said, man, that, I'm supposed to have joy. I don't know what happened to it, you know. But uh, <laughs> I got sidetracked there for a minute because I saw, I saw, I had a flashback looking at some of y'all's faces. And um, <laughs> y'all come into church like, I'm not going to smile. And um, <laughs> one time a man, yeah, hey, we prayed, we was in revival with him. He got mad because I did just what I did right there. I get sidetracked. It don't matter to me. Jesus is in control. And uh, I told some jokes or whatever. And I have no jokes written down. 
So I'm not racist, biased. I'll tell a white joke, black joke, green joke, Chinese joke. I don't care, you know. I'm just one of those guys who go to a Mexican restaurant. I'll suddenly, I get their accent. It's like, what do you want? A fajita, a fajita, a fajita, a fajita. Um, and uh, it don't matter to me, you know. I'm, you can't offend me. If you get mad at me, just unfriend me. It wasn't my friend anyway, you know what I mean? <laughs> And what, it's not like I'm going to go, you know, cry and drink another Mountain Dew. I can't drink Mountain Dews anymore, so that's over. And so this dude called one of my friends, and he says, my God, the guy gets up there and reads a text and preaches a little bit, and people start laughing. He said, my whole church is laughing. And he said, if I'd have wanted a jokester, I'd have hired a clown. And my buddy said, how many people have gotten the Holy Ghost in three weeks in your church? He said, 63. He said, how many got the Holy Ghost last year in your church the whole year? He went 12. He said, sounds to me like your church needs to laugh a little bit. I'm happy I've got the Holy Ghost. I'm not sad about it. I'm glad. Honey, I'm so happy that I'm not in jail today. You wouldn't understand. Amen. I, there's joy, the Bible said, and the Holy Ghost has got joy. Hallelujah. And so, and so Abraham, he, he, he's in God's ticked off. And he says, I'm just fixing to kill them all. Wipe them all out. And you know the story how that Abraham, he, he, the Bible says he went and stood before the Lord. And he starts trying to talk to the Lord. He said, hey, if there's 50 and the Lord agrees. And then, he, and then Abraham starts thinking about it. And he says, well, maybe if there's like 45 and the Lord agrees. And and then he says, you know, maybe if there's like 40 and, and the Lord agrees. And then Abraham's doubting. And he says, well, maybe if there's 30 and the Lord agrees. And he got down to 20 and the Lord agrees. And finally, Abraham said in his mind, surely after 20 years in Sodom, Lot has convinced 10 people about the one God. So I'm going to try to make a deal for 10 because his family, he's got two daughters, a wife, and him. That's four. All he's got to do is get six, and surely in 10, 20 years, he's at least convinced six people that there's one God. And so I will, I will stand before the Lord and pray adventure. In other words, I am praying that you will not do what you plan to do if, you can, if I can find 10 people that know about you. And the Lord says, great. His wrath is about to be loosed on Sodom. But the reason Abraham stood before the Lord was because he loved Lot. So I want to preach about those, the power of those that stand before the Lord. The power of those that stand before the Lord. See, Abraham didn't know anybody else in the city. Abraham knew his nephew was in the city. And his nieces were in the city. But he didn't know anything else or anybody else. And so when God tells him I am about to wipe the entire city out. Abraham, because of his love for this family member, decides I do not want him to die. And if God is going to wipe them all out, 
then I am willing to stand before this God and say, God, I've got some family members that are living in a sinful condition and I don't know if they know you or not, but can you please don't do what you think you're about to do? In other words, God was saying, if you're going to stand before me and you're going to cry out, then I will hold my hand. Revival doesn't happen because people are just willing to come to church. Revival happens because people are willing to stand before God for their kinfolks. Let me say that again so it'll get into your spirit. Revival can happen anywhere where you have a nucleus of people praying for revival. It doesn't say that you come to church, you sit down, you get entertained by the choir, you've got the children's ministry, all of that is man-made stuff that we did. The book of Acts had 8,000 people in a matter of days and they didn't even have a praise team. What they had was one message and that message got to people's heart and other people got a hold of the message and went and got their friends and said, you better come hear this message. I'm telling you right now, I just got an experience. In other words, I'm not ashamed of being an apostolic. You need to be an apostolic. If you don't want to come, I'll just go to the next person. But I'm not going to stop talking about Jesus and what Jesus has done for me. But you're not going to intimidate me I'll worry the fire out of you. Somebody just stand and clap your hands to the Lord. You, 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 you could be seated for just a minute. I'm not preaching long. I'm just preaching to this church. See, you, you can't talk revival down. Me and Brother Martin talk revival. I've got friends that one night we were talking revival and, you know, I mean, I play golf and I used to. I couldn't there for a little while. They've released me to do it again. If you don't like preachers playing golf, then don't talk to me about it. I quit cocaine. I ain't quitting everything. And, <laughs> and I do a lot of praying on the golf course. Lord, where'd that ball go? <laughs> That's two dollars, Jesus, and um, <laughs> and so there were some preachers got together, and they were sitting around, and we're talking about the Lord in this big dining room, and the women were off in some other living room or whatever it was, and we were talking about God, and time kept slipping away, and we didn't realize that it was well past midnight, and we didn't know that. And it was after a time of refreshing and, and all of a sudden, I mean, the Holy Ghost was getting on me and we were talking about miracles and, and I'm thinking, my God, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost, man. And, and, and I looked and I'd never been in the man's backyard and suddenly I saw a field of grass through the wall, saw a field of grass and a little bridge and some woods and out of the woods were coming these lights. They were just traveling towards this wall. And I'm staring right past this man and looking at this wall, and I'm thinking, what in the world am I seeing? It's a vision of a backyard with a little bridge, with a creek and some woods, and these, these, there's hundreds of lights coming out of those woods at us, and they just kept coming and coming and coming, and all of a sudden they walked through the wall, and every preacher, I think there was either eight or 12, I can't remember, fell out in the Holy Ghost, every one of us just fell out of our chair speaking in tongues. Two years later, one of those preachers was preaching a TOR. 
And he turned around and he said, Brother Poe, you remember the time that we were all talking? And I said, yeah. And he said, I went into a vision and I saw a green backyard with a little bridge and a piece of big woods and light began to come and I started getting my hair just started going straight up. I had never told anybody what happened because we laid on the floor and spoke for two hours in tongues. That's old fashioned religion. Some of you, we can't even get you out of the chair when we're praising God much less and you're telling me you've got backslidden children and you're sitting there not worried about it you need to be coming to the altar and standing before the Lord saying I'm not letting my children go to hell I'm not letting my in-laws go to hell I'm not going to let my cousins go to hell I'm not going to let my grandchildren no sir the devil ain't going so you're just sitting there looking at me like well you know I don't know you better get on your feet and you better start standing before the Lord because Jesus is coming. The rapture is about to happen. Hell, you never get out of it. And unless the church begins to pray and the church begins to react, we've got a lot of loved ones that are going to go to hell because we're not praying. You, you, you can be seated. You can't talk revival down. You can't just say, boy, I wish we had revival. You make revival. See, I love to read history. I like all that. But I love making history. Let me give you an example. You say, well, look, were you in the war? Yes, I was. What kind? What were in the Navy? What were you? Submarine, torpedoman. That's, that's crazy. We lived under the water in a hundred foot boat, hundred hundred yard hundred yard boat. The USS Tyree, USS Four Sixteen. I just showed my wife a picture of it. In fact, got Galveston had one down there tied up for a long time. She wouldn't even go down in it because it's so claustrophobic. And I used to live in that thing. Well, all right, that's good. But we lost that war. So America don't win every war. You, let me, can I say it like this? You only win a war when you're ready to wipe the enemy out. Can I say that again? You're only going to win a war when you're ready to wipe the enemy out, not make a peace agreement with them. Not give them back the territory you took. In other words, you're my enemy and everything you do, I'm against you and I will use every weapon that the Lord has, devil. You're not going to take my children. You're not going to take my grandfather. You're not going to take my uncle. You're not going to take my wife. You're not, are you hearing me? You're not going to, why? Because I am going to stand before the Lord and the Lord is going to hear me. And the Lord, I worry the Lord until he says, I'll stop it. I'll change it. I'm going to rearrange it. Are you getting the message this morning? I don't want my children to go to hell. And I'm going to call Emily's name out every day. Me and my wife pray for my baby girl every day. And today she's going to hell in a handbasket. And she knows I call her name from the pulpit. And I'm not ashamed of it. But because I want to see Emily speaking in tongues and run to the aisles like she did when she was a teenager. So I'm standing before the Lord for my daughter. Somebody holler amen. You, you, you can be seated. I'm, I'm, I've got to, I've got to hurry. Where in the world in this Bible does it say unspoken requests? Where? Show me one scripture. Not two, three, it don't even ask for that. Just one. Can I preach this a little bit? There's not one thing in the whole entire Bible that says an unspoken request will be answered. He says, speak unto this mountain. You know what the difference is in Pentecost today? It's some, one of the differences is is when the old timers prayed, they named who they prayed about. 
and they didn't even care if they were sitting there. I was there, my grandmother was praying for a man that had a gun on, this is before it was even legal, and he had, his name was Mr. Green, and my grandmother sitting right behind him, and then and, and they gave the altar call, and grandmother said, God, she didn't duck her head like we do today. You know, take that 30-second nap. Mumble stuff God can't even hear. Hello? I'm hitting you. Pastor says pray and 15 people pray. And then we've got to say out loud. And you're like, oh my God, what do I say out loud? (laughs) My grandmother didn't do that, young people. Your mamas and daddies do that. Grandmas and grandpas, my grandmother did this. God, Mr. Green's standing right in front of me. God, if you come back right now, he's going to hell. And God, he needs the Holy Ghost. And here's a good opportunity for him to get his hide in the altar. And God, I'm asking you to delay your coming where Mr. Green can have the Holy Ghost. And she reached up and touched him and he took off running to the altar and he got the Holy Ghost right then. You know why? Because he heard somebody standing before the Lord for him. She wasn't afraid to call your name out. She wasn't afraid to lay hands on you. She didn't want anybody to go to hell. And she stood before the Lord for everybody. (laughs) Hallelujah. Now we, we, we say, if you don't, if you have an unspoken request, raise your hand. What is that all about? That means you don't have the guts enough to ask for it. See, I, I call it stinking thinking. It's like, well, I've got one, but I don't want anybody to know it. Another one I'm going to give you. Stinking thinking. There's none righteous, no, not one. Where's that at? It's in the Bible. What's it talking about? Gentiles. Nothing else. Y'all are going, what? What? It says David was right. David was righteous. That's in the Old Testament. Now watch this. The fervent prayer of a... Well, if there's none righteous, then there's no fervent prayer. See, that scripture is misquoted to make you feel comfortable because you feel I'm unrighteous and I'm unworthy, so I shouldn't go up there. No, 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 no. the unrighteousness was that the Gentiles, he didn't think, could have the Holy Ghost because he classified them unrighteous. But we're grafted into the vine. So if we're grafted into the vine of the righteous one, then we are righteous. Oh, you're not hearing me. Because the same blood that went through Jesus now comes. Now flows to us. Are you hearing me? Even if you made a mistake, you're still classified as righteous. Somebody give Jesus some praise right now. Somebody give Jesus some praise right now. Hallelujah. See, that's the way the devil has trapped some of y'all. Some people say, well, you're cocky. See, that's stupid. I'm not cocky, I'm convinced. There's a lot of difference. Cocky people can't ever prove nothing. Convinced people don't need to prove it. They just do it. Oh, you didn't hear me. Cocky people don't run it. Cocky people don't run in fives and tens and one do do all the talking. It's like, we're all going to whip you. I was convinced. I loved it when a man would come up to me and say, I'm fixing to knock you out. 
I love that. You know why? He wasn't ready. He was having to get ready. I stayed ready. I was the energizer ready bunny before the bunny had a bass drum. If a man walked up to me and said, we're about to fight, I knocked his front teeth out. I, was, I wasn't like about to warm up and do kung fu and all this stuff. That's why I love fighting Chinese. They get, uh, by the time they do that, redneck done pull something out. Bam, oh, we don't go through no warm-ups. That's why I carry a stick. <laughs> I used to carry a hatchet. <laughs> Y'all look at me like, what? <laughs> yeah, man, you pull a hatchet out on somebody, see what they'll do. It's like, eek, 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 eek. I do, Mary, I do carry a hatchet. And the next time you put your hand up under that SS seat, everybody goes, no, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. See, we, we, we come in here and we don't stand before the Lord. We don't pray. My mother started a church with 12 women that prayed. That's still alive today. It's called Calvary Christian Tabernacle right there in Longview, Texas. And they, didn't, they didn't know anything except testify and pray. Read a, read a scripture too, testify and pray. Next service, read a scripture to testify and pray. Suddenly people are crawling up the stairs to the upper, uh, upper level of my grandfather's garage. And suddenly my mama tells grandma, grandma, we got to have a bigger place. And my papa owned all these property. And Gracie Lou went to papa and said, honey, uh, Joe, you're going to have to clear out the J.B. White Auto store because we need another church. You need to buy another building. And, and, and you know what my papa did? Cleaned out the church and they went down the stairs and they read scriptures and prayed. When they got to be about 40, they got them a pastor. You know what they did? Read scriptures and prayed until revival hit Longview and then they moved out on Marbley Street and then they moved up on High Street and now they're at Calvary Tabernacle. You know why? Because there was people that were saying, I'm not letting my grandchildren go to hell. I'm not letting my grandfather go to hell. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep blessing I'm going to keep praising God. I'm going to stand before the Lord. I didn't come to church to be entertained. I came to church to praise God and worship his name. And I want something in return. I want my children to be saved. Somebody give Jesus a little praise right now. You, you, you could be seated. My mother was a praying woman. She was, there was a knock on her door years ago. She lived in Gladewater. Some people brought her a present from Africa and said, thank you very much for coming to our village. With my, my, my family had sent this over to you, and we finally located you. And my mother said, I've never been to Africa. And she goes, yes, you have. She said, no, I've never been to Africa. And she said, well, yes, you did. You came and taught our kids in our language about the one God along with two great big white images. And my mother replied, oh, I've had a burden for Africa for years. Oh, you're not hearing me. And the Lord said, see, we want to believe half the Bible. But if Enoch was translated and not found, and one old boy was moved from this location in the desert to that location for one man, you young people don't even really know what apostolic Pentecostals are all about. We're about God being able to take your prayer and manifest it over in another country and that country come to Jesus because you're, are you hearing me right now? 
You say, well, I ain't never heard none of that. Well, it's time we do hear it. And it's time we start praying till it happens. If you want Iceland to have a revival, you got to do more than wave the flag and let him do all the praying. you got to say, God, whatever it is in Iceland that's captivated Iceland, I refuse to allow that country to go to hell and be under a dictator that doesn't believe. Are you hearing me? I've got to stand before the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, stand before the Lord. Don't let the preacher do all the praying. Kids are backsliding. Families tearing apart. It's because prayer is left. Nobody stands in the gap. Everybody's scared. Intimidated. Well, it's not my personality. Get it. Every one of you ladies, every one of you ladies have two things in common. When you get mad, you raise your voice. I ain't never heard no woman that go, you know, I'm really mad at you. I mean, I want you to know that you didn't take out the trash today, and that's really that's t- really ticked me off. And, and you didn't wash my car either. And I, I don't know if you noticed, my floor mats are dirty, and my gas tank's nearly empty. So I'm mad. Don't forget it all day. <laughs> I'm mad. Come back in an hour later. Hey, baby, I won't talk to you. Remember, I'm mad. I ain't never heard no woman do that. Women, when they get mad, all kinds of mess starts happening. Head gets all messed up. Hips get out of joint. Hand gets up in there. Voice raises up. Hey, what about my car? Have you been in it lately? No. Why? Because it's on E and you'd have known it. You tell your children, get up, and if they don't, did you hear what I said? I said, get up or I'll pull you out of that bed right now. If you think you're skipping school because you got a stomachache, you'll skip school all right because your rear end's hurting so bad, your stomach's about ready to throw up. Get up out of that bed. And you know what? I ain't never heard no man do that. They better not do that. I'm mad at you. Now, I'm sure there's some men that might say it like that. Okay, but not in my world. (laughs) Have they ever said it like that in my world? I'm mad at you. Oh, excuse me. I thought was about to shout. (laughs) Next time they talk. (laughs) But when we start praying, it's low-keyed. Lord, I want you to know how God is just. Uh, and you know what? We have the peekaboo prayers. We get in the altar finally, and then we raise our hands, and we look to see where the preacher is. When he's right here, Jesus, you know, God, you know, you know, you know. Thank you that he did not pray for me. I praise your name. I went to a prayer room one time. I'm quitting. I went to a prayer room. I can't stand go to prayer rooms. They're like funeral parlors. I went to a prayer room one time, and, 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 and men were praying, and they were doing a circle. And here's what they were saying. I know this looks stupid, but you should have been there. When they didn't pray through, God in the Holy Ghost, no, no, they didn't. Uh, they, and they, they were praying like this, Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, you're a God almighty. Jesus, hallelujah, praise God. Lord, I love you, my God, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise God. Lord, I love you, praise God. Lord, hallelujah, amen. Jesus, you're almighty, amen. Hall- I, 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 it was like trying to get in a... It, 
get in the, you know, I got to get in the circle somewhere. And it's finally in the light. It was like, <laughs> like jump rope. Jesus, hallelujah. And all of a sudden, I'm doing the same thing. Jesus, hallelujah, glory to God, hallelujah, praise God. Jesus, there's only one of you. Lord, you're the creator, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And all of a sudden, I just got a vision in my mind of Jesus up there going, Jesus, yes, God, yes, Lord, yes. Hallelujah, thank you. Amen, praise God. I love you, thanks. I appreciate that. They weren't even saying nothing. And I got this little little thought in my mind. The little angel that ain't even got his wings like shorty, come up here, listen to him. When they need something, let me know and I'll give you a new pair of wings. Hello. And then I went on the women's side. I thought, my God, women can pray. And on the women's side, they were doing this number. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. God, I praise you for it. Lord. Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise, oh, Lord. Oh, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Gee, praise the Lord. I mean, you get up and you can see their slip. It was like, they were wearing saggy skirts. Four men were wearing saggy breeches. Y'all ought to go in your prayer room sometimes. I got quiet, didn't it? <laughs> you know what you ought to hear out of a prayer room in this church? God, Coolio's going to jail, but God gives her a way for you to make a way where there seemeth to be no way. God, Alex is going to prison. God, I've got a crystal meth freak right down the highway from me. Lord, uh, they're dealing drugs on my street. Is there a way for me to be able to, oh, you're not hearing me. God, I'm fixing to stand before you for my street. I don't want anybody to go to hell that I work with. I'm going to call out every name I work with. I'm putting them on a list. And when I get to praying, something's going to start shaking. Something's fixing to start moving. God, one day they're walking in the back door. Somebody praise God a little bit. Hallelujah. Can you imagine what it was like for Sister Hazel Poe? to have started that church and now has got two sons playing in rock and roll. Long hair. She knows without a shot of a doubt that both of her sons were in drugs and alcoholics. Kelly was found on the side of the road with a running truck completely passed out from alcoholism. Do you realize that one day going about a hundred and something miles an hour, I, my road runner went into the ditch in the right side from Tyler, Texas. I'm going sideways in a ditch, fixing to run into a river by myself fighting the wheel, trying to get back on the highway. And suddenly the road runner snapped back up on the highway, went straight through the bridge, and went straight down the road. And all that time I was thinking, man, I made it through that. Let me tell you what I made it through. My mother was praying, I don't know where my boys are tonight. But Lord, somebody's got to pray for them. 
And God, I don't know where Gordon is. And God's saying, Hazel, if you're going to stand in the gap for Gordon, he's about to have a wreck in Tyler, Texas. But I'm going to put his roadrunner right back up on the highway. And I'm going to keep your, I'm going to keep your, I'm going to keep your prayers as a memorial. Kelly's on the side of the highway and should have died from carbon dioxide. But instead, I'm going to keep him breathing. All, you're not hearing me, see? If you was hearing me, you would be on your feet saying, I've got to start praying and standing before the Lord. I've got to start standing before the Lord. I've got to start standing before the Lord. You can be seated for a minute. See, the other night I was woken up at 4.30 with no name, just pray. And I walked into the living room and sat down praying for somebody who I don't know. But somebody needed prayer. Somebody somewhere needed me to get up and pray at 4.30. I have a friend that he left a crusade and he was getting changed in his room and the Lord told him, call so-and-so. Now my brother, my buddy, one of my buddies had preached a message and this man had gotten so mad that he walked out in the middle of the message, just walked out, got up and walked out and never came back to church. And my evangelist friend called me. He said, that just stunned me. And I said, well, that's just the way it is, man. Sometimes they can't take it. They don't want to change. And nothing you can do will stop it. But that night, the pastor, he's in the hotel, and the Lord tells him, tells him, call that guy. And he reaches over and he dials that number. And it's after 12, because we'd already been talking. And in, it rang and it went to voicemail and he hung up. The Lord said, call him. He called him again, he went to voicemail, and he said, hey man, I'm just calling you. And hung up. It's his pastor just calling you. Hung up. And the Lord said, call him. This time, sister, it didn't go to voicemail. It just kept ringing. And it kept ringing. And it kept ringing, which is abnormal for any of our cell phones. Can I get a witness? And it kept ringing. And 20 minutes in, it's still ringing. He goes, takes a shower, and gets ready to go to bed, and looks on his pillow, Pastor, and the phone is still ringing. And he picks it up, thinking this has been over 45 minutes, and this phone is still ringing. And suddenly, on the other end of the line, the man says, what do you want? And the pastor said, I just wanted you to know I'm praying for you. And I wanted you to know that you're welcome. And the man immediately broke down. He said, Pastor, you don't understand. 45 minutes ago, I walked into the shower with a gun in my hand turned the water on and was fixing to commit suicide. And for 45 minutes, that cell phone has been sitting there ringing and ringing because I said, the moment it quits ringing, I'm pulling the trigger. 
But that pastor was standing before the Lord. And the Lord was saying, it ain't going to stop ringing. I have charge over the cell phone towers too. I've got charge over voicemail too. I've got charge over that. Me- Come on, are you hearing me? Come on, Atascacita. It's time for somebody to get a burden for people that have backslidden and gone away from Christ. It's time for us to start start standing before the Lord for people that we know and love. You can be seated. I was in one church years ago, many years ago. All of a sudden, I saw a death angel fly across, just real quick, fly across. And the Lord said, somebody's going to die. So I walked out in this row right here and I said, somebody sits right here. And I said, you better tell that man he better get back to Christ or he's going to die. He was working in the Gulf down here at Galveston. He was from Mississippi. His family got up from there immediately and drove all night, called him, drove all night and paid a helicopter to go out to the pad to pick that guy up. And by the next night, Dwayne was sitting right there in that chair. I look out there and I see that girl that had an empty chair beside her. And I walked out to him And I said, young man, the death angel is flying. He's flown, and if you don't get right with God, I am pronouncing your death right now. Now, us Pentecostals, we just get real paranoid. But you know what? There was 40,000 Israelites that didn't cross one line in the sand. That's all they didn't do. They just said, I'm not going to take a step towards the right stuff. And the Lord said, because you won't move, I'll move the earth and we'll never hear from you again. So see, Pentecost, it isn't all pretty. Revival sometimes gets dirty, nasty. You're going to sweat. You're going to sweat tears. You're going to sweat sweat. You're going to cry until your blouses are wet. You're going to cry until your suits are messed up. But if you want your family saved, it's more than clapping your hands. It's more than patting your feet. It's more than just a little hand wave. It's like Brother David said, I'm fixing to make this church the biggest church in Houston, Texas, and I'm going to do it through prayer. I'm calling out the name of my loved ones. You, you could be seated. And, and so I, I looked at that guy and, and didn't know, obviously, that he was a backslider. And he goes running to the altar over here. I want all you young people to hear me. Brother Poe's seen a lot of stuff that a lot of Pentecostals don't want to see. They don't even want to admit it, but they want to preach about it. They want to preach about angels. But you get one in the church and it freaks them out. I can't understand that. And now we're raising a generation that knows more about light ones than they do the horns on the altar. Hallelujah, I'm about to get a preach on me. I'm trying to be easy today. Don't be easy. Hallelujah. This man's praying his guts out. And I'm over there praying with him because I don't want to see anybody pass away. The Lord gave him a warning, he heeded it. And I'm asking God, please, God, the dude came. I don't even know where, I didn't, know, I didn't even know the story, see. And I just thought he was at home. And, you know, I didn't know about all the going to Galveston and helicopter pay and all that. I didn't know all that. And I'm saying, Lord, he heeded. He's here. He's here. He's here, God. He's here. Please. Well, there was a white-haired man right over here, and he's just interceding. He is crying. He is praying. He is just 
Lord, and, and I go back over here and I pray for him again. And then I keep noticing this white-headed man. And then this guy here, he prays through. And, and the white-headed man, and they hug and all this. And let me tell you a story, young people. This was his father. The father died six weeks later because the father had prayed. Lord, if you gotta take somebody, spare my boy, but take me, cause I'm ready. And the orders had been given that somebody would pay a sacrifice. And six weeks later, the daddy passes away. But the boy was saved because the daddy stood before the Lord and said, I'm ready to go, but please let my son have a little reprieve. Oh, I'm preaching to some people in Atascacita this morning. Some of y'all have backslidden kinfolk. You need to run to this altar right now, and you need to start throwing their names out in the air. Some of you need to run to this altar right now and start praying like you've never prayed before. Some of you need to run to this altar and start calling out their names and stand before God for them. There needs to be a sound that comes from this sanctuary. Young people, you're walking by people every day that's going to hell. You need to get a picture in their mind right now. Lord, and you're, come on, pray it out loud. Pray it out loud. This is not a silent prayer. This is a prayer of God. Save their soul. Save their soul. Stir them up. Stir them up, God. Stir them up. Come on, pray it out loud. Let this place ring with prayers. Who cares if somebody hears you? They should be praying. Who cares if somebody else isn't praying? You pray and let God hear your prayer. I pray in the name of Jesus that the backsliders that have sat on the pews of Atascacita Pentecostal Church wherever they are today wherever they are right now God that you stir their heart that you send angels that you send conviction that you send it into their homes right now God stir the man that's about to open a beer to watch an old football game God stir that woman that just got through messing with her hair yesterday and let her be convicted right now the teenagers that have walked away the teenagers that used to sing in the choir come on are you hearing me I hear the cries of a Tascacita coming up before the Lord I hear the cry of a Tascacita Cedar coming up before the Lord and we're saying we're standing in the gap we're standing in the gap come on tell their names call their names call their names call their names call their names Abraham was saying don't do it to Lot let him be free I'll stand before you God Hi, this is Pastor Kevin Martin, and I just want to thank y'all for joining us today, tuning in and being a part of our service. We hope that it was a blessing to you and that you were uplifted and encouraged and felt the presence of the Lord. If you would like to know more about our church, please join us at www.atascacitaupc.com and you will find all of the ministries. You will find pictures where you could take a journey and see everything that's been going on at the Pentecostal Church of Atascacita. And uh, we hope that you join us again very soon. God bless you.